This is the end of the message of the Lord Jesus Christ, written out for us in the book here of Revelation. Now, you remember we started about a week and a half ago uh, looking back to the book of Genesis and finding themes, and finding the themes of light and creation, themes of decision, and, and in particular that question, who is on the Lord's side? We're going to see these themes as we run through our evening tonight. And in particular, we'll see the answer to that question, who is on the Lord's side in all of its, in all of its glory. These last chapters of the Bible mark the culmination of God's plan, the final overthrow of wickedness and the beauty of a world that is reborn, that's bathed in, in light and colour and health and righteousness with God as its focus, with Jesus Christ as king, and you and I there with him. Revelation has documented in advance this, this whirlwind of, of human experience, so much of it full of violence and pain, and it makes it really hard to read some of those sections, knowing that these are the lives of men and women who called on God as their saviour. That knowing that we're, what we're reading about is the spilling of the blood of the saints that's been spilled over the years. But God has heard, and we, we can have confidence in that. Each and every time, God has known those who are his. And he keeps their memory alive so that when the time is right, they will all rise to life again. The first century disciples who knew Jesus personally, they will rise to life again. The faithful who, who ran from Diocletian and were, were killed for their commitment to God, they will rise to life again. Those disciples who opened their Bibles in fear of their lives in the dark ages, and even today, on the eve of Christ's return, those who struggle against the influence of a world that doesn't know God, God knows those who are his. God knows you because you've been called. And you've seen throughout this book how those glimpses of hope keep shining through. All I've done here is to, is to document those little glimpses, those, those bright spots in Revelation, uh, the Revelation story. This is not a tale of doom and gloom. This is a record of salvation. And all of those bright spots that you're seeing there on the screen at the moment are little cameos of what the world will be like, what the kingdom will be like. This book is all about how God is saving his people from a world that doesn't understand him and how God is creating a future for them. So our plan tonight is obviously to complete our Revelation study. Um, and what we're going to be doing is looking at the last four books uh, of Revelation as outlined here on this slide. So these are the things as we start in chapter 19. Uh, so you just drop back a few pages, a few chapters to uh, Revelation chapter 19. We're going to start by looking at um, the summary of, of God's judgments that we saw on Sunday night with Brother Sam. Um, we'll be looking at the bride herself. We'll be looking at the, the Lamb's victories. And then as we move into chapter 20, the snapshot of the millennium, a thousand-year reign, and then following that, rebellion. And then finally, in chapter 21, we come to this vision of New Jerusalem and, uh, and then into chapter 22 with Jesus' final appeal. So, so that's where we're going uh, in our study and um, we'll, we'll keep, moving, keep moving through. So we start the final leg of our journey in chapter 19 and, and it opens with a shout. A whole group of people in heaven saying, hallelujah. Now, I've got my chat open. Hopefully you've got your chat open as well. You've already gone over um, the symbols of Revelation. All the way through, we've been seeing the same symbols popping up over and over again. So jump on chat now and uh, remind me, when we're reading about heaven in Revelation, what's it talking about? Who are these people in heaven? <clears throat> Political pow powers, politics, yes. So, so the heavens, if you remember back a few studies, uh, we talked about the the heavens being a symbol of government. So, so politics and rulers, absolutely. So that's, that's where we're thinking. These are people who are in positions of power, in, in positions of authority. 
And they're all shouting hallelujah. Again, uh, stay on chat. Tell me, what does hallelujah mean? It's actually a Hebrew word that's been translated into, into Greek phonetically. What does hallelujah mean? What are they, what are they shouting and, and saying from heaven? Praise to God. Praise to God. Absolutely. Glory to God. Praise to God. Exactly. In fact, in fact, it actually includes the name Yah. So hallelujah is that, that, that last bit of the word there is specifically praise to Yahweh himself. And why are they giving praise? Because they're saying salvation and glory and honour and power belong to him. So this crowd of people risen to power and serving God, these are the saints, as you said. These are the saints of the future age. So let's take a look then at where we are on our timeline. So this is the, the timeline that we've been following through with the seven seals followed by the seven trumpets and then the seven uh, vials as we finally get towards the end section. And as we do that, we zoom in on that end section and we see that it's also uh, the section here that's, uh, that's, that's recorded in chapter 19 um, is in the kingdom age. These are saints who have been raised already. So this is our time frame. The saints are praising God because of his judgments on the woman called Babylon the Great. Now, it's also interesting as you go through Revelation that it's not chronological necessarily um, in, in every aspect because you have those moments of brightness. And so uh, you'll also note that we have uh, at the same, the same time, Revelation 4, the events of Revelation 4 are taking place and the, the events of Revelation 14 all occur in this uh, period of, of the future. So, so this is the time when Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots the, and abominations of the earth, as we talked, talked about on, on Sunday, um, has been destroyed. And this is the reason why they're saying hallelujah. So verse 1 makes that link, right? It's important to, to note these linking words. Verse 1 makes the link after these things. So it refers directly back to those events found in chapter, chapter 18. After these things, chapter 18 finished with the destruction of the great harlot, the, the religious opposition to God that's symbolised as a prostitute. And that opposition is characterised by its unfaithfulness to God, by its immorality and by its unrighteousness. And these are all things that need to be overturned in order to move forward into, into the uh, kingdom age. There are four hallelujahs in Revelation, and they're all here in chapter 19. Hallelujah means praise to Yah. Verse 1, verse 3, verse 4, and verse 6, the, the hallelujahs are raised in um, in adoration of the one true God. On, on Sunday night, Sam touched on some of the reasons why the saints will be so delighted to see the end of false religion. And, and, and this is because they have seen and they have experienced the corruption of the Babylonian Roman influence. In the name of false religion, God's family have been persecuted and killed. And they agree wholeheartedly, these saints who are who are shouting from heaven, from, from that uh, seat of government, they agree wholeheartedly with God that this system is wicked and needs to be removed. Let me just add one more reason here. Um, God loves truth. God hates deception. And the longest-running lie in history started all the way back in the Garden of Eden. That lie that the serpent told, you shall not surely die. And since then... Every religion that has taught that there is life beyond the grave other than through Jesus Christ has continued that lie. So finally, that, that lie is going to be done away with. And now with Jesus returned, with saints of all epochs of history gathered around him, they are in absolute agreement that God is right and just. And that they will follow Jesus as he sets about the task of confronting the evil in the world and replacing it with righteousness. So we're now introduced to the bride. 
But I want to put up a contrast because really we have these two women that are described in, in Revelation, uh, Revelation 19. One exits and the other one comes to ascendancy. So let, let's just run through this and I'll put these up side by side. These are the things that we know about, number one, the, the prostitute called Babylon the Great, who is unfaithful and unholy, and the things that we know about the bride, the lamb's wife, who is, by definition, the complete opposite. She is faithful. She is holy. When I put this list up, what is the thing that you notice? What jumps out at you? They do both have power in their own way. They like influence over people, says Austin. Thank you. They're both women. Yep. So they're both, uh, they're both uh, similar, similar in that respect. So there is a religious um, component to them. That's, that's true. The other thing that I've noticed, um, and I think is probably going to be immediately obvious when I, when I mention it, is the fact that we're told exactly one thing, one thing more about the bride. It's the fact that she is wearing white linen, no, fine linen, clean and white. And that I find really interesting because previously the son of man had all sorts of descriptive details. And even here, this, this harlot, you'll, you'll see, has a whole lot of specific details about you know, the, the symbols that define her. But the bride of Christ has just one defining attribute, just one. And it's not even hers. So verse, verse 8, now jump ahead to verse 8. To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, which is the righteousness of the saints. According to the Diagos version, this is fine linen, bright and pure. Fine linen, bright and pure. And, of course, there's a little light bulb that goes off in your heads if you've read Daniel chapter 12, because Daniel chapter 12 talks about the fact that those who are wise will shine as the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Isn't it fascinating that the defining feature of the bride, that covering of righteousness, is not something that she's made for herself. It's a clear shining reminder of the changes that God has made. Mortality is gone. Immortality is taking its place and bride and bridegroom are united. So let me ask then, how do we, how do we know who the bride is? And I'll, uh, I, I won't make you turn to these quotes, but uh, feel free to take notes and you can look them up in your own time. So originally, there was a connection with natural Israel. And so you have verses like Isaiah 45 that... Uh, that's Isaiah 54, verse 5, sorry, that's, that say, uh, thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the holy one of Israel, talking to Israel. So Israel had that special connection um, with, with God. Unfortunately, as time went on and as they moved further away from God, they were also then considered to have been treacherous. They were considered to have been unfaithful. And so Jeremiah, in particular, talks about the fact that, that Israel had forsaken their husband. Um, and in their place, instead of just a natural seed, there was the resurrection of a spiritual seed, of spiritual Israel. And so we start to talk about um, the ecclesia as spiritual Israel. Ephesians chapter 5, husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the ecclesia and gave himself for it. So feel free to chase down some of those references in your, in your own time. There's, uh, there's a lot of links uh, going back to the betrothed and the bride and, um, and the links that are made between, between Jesus and the ecclesia. <clears throat> but the work is not done. And I think as we, as we start to step through the chapter here, we realise that this is not a narrative about an amazing marriage celebration or, or an amazing marriage feast. That will take place, but it's not the focus of this chapter. The focus is on the work that's being done. Now that the bride has joined her bridegroom, together they go out and they, and they, um, and they start that work. And so it, it begins almost immediately. As we move through to, um, 
to, to verse 11. Um, now we're going to have to keep moving because we have more than a thousand years to get through in this, the rest of this presentation. Um, and what that means is that as we're tracking through chapter 19, it follows Jesus Christ in his role as commander of the armies of God. He's riding a white horse and he leads out the army of the saints who are also on white horses. He's called faithful and true. In fact, he's given three different names. And you might hear echoes uh, back to the letters uh, to the ecclesias in, uh, in, in the first couple of chapters of Revelation. So the three names that he's given here, uh, in verse 11, he's called the faithful and true. In verse 13, he's, he's known as the word of God. In verse 16, he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the captain of many kings who follow him because you have the saints who are with him, who are in, the, in their own right, kings and priests. But you'll notice that there's only one king of kings. They all uh, give their allegiance to their captain, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a couple of things that we'll notice about the, the way Jesus is depicted here in, in this setting. It's warlike. It's going out with an army to battle. You'll also notice that he has many crowns. As we, as we read through, um, the crowns that are, that are upon his head in verse 12 are symbols of rulership. They're symbols of nations that have already uh, given their allegiance to, uh, to the Son of God. He's wearing a robe dipped in blood. And you'll notice that that's different to the rest of the multitude who are with him. All of the rest have uh, fine linen, clean and white. <laughs> so, so that robe that was given to them at the marriage is also useful as battle garments. That's what they wear from now on, is that, that, uh, that righteousness that they wear um, uh, as, as a reminder of the God that they serve. But their, but their captain has a robe that's dipped in blood. It's a reminder there of the, the sacrifice that he, that he gave and the way in which all of the saints ended up with, uh, with their, their white robes being washed and purified. What about his sword? You see in the, in the description there, he's got a, a sharp sword that he's not carrying in his hand. He's, he's carrying it, it's coming out of his mouth. And it's a long sword with a, with a great reach and this is not a military sword. This is um, Hebrews chapter 4 talks about the sharp sword that he has is the word of God, quick and powerful and sharper than any, any two-edged sword. And talking about the words that he's speaking, the, the message that he's taking to, uh, to the rest of the world. And then finally, I found this really interesting, um, trying to figure out the, the symbol of the white horse because we've seen white horses before all the way back to uh, the early uh, early Roman Empire. Is this white horse the same as we saw earlier in Revelation? I tend to think that it's not, nor are the white horses of those who are riding with him. But elves are described in a warlike setting with, um, with God as their leader and, and they're described as God's bow and, and as God's sword. But they're also described, and I've taken this from the New King James, as his royal horse in the battle. And I wonder whether this symbol is a symbol that defines the involvement of the nation of Israel as Jesus goes out. Now, bearing in mind that this is after the, um, the, the destruction of, the, uh, of the, the, the Roman Catholic system, and this is the subjugation of the nations of the world. And so Israel has already been chastised, has already been converted and already follows their Messiah in truth. And here, if this symbol is correct, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you that challenge of going back to Zechariah and having a look at chapters 9 and 10, um, that they are empowered to be the vehicle that, um, that goes out to war with the Lord Jesus Christ. So I mentioned that Babylon the Great, the, the Roman Catholic system, uh, is now overthrown. So what, what remains and what's taking place here is for all nations to hear that Jesus has returned and to be given the opportunity to respond. I, I want you to um, 
come back, if you will, to Revelation chapter 14, because I mentioned this happens at about the same time, at exactly the same time, in fact. So Revelation 14 has three messages um, given to the world by three angels. And we're looking, starting at uh, verse 6. The first message that the angel takes out as this angel is flying in the midst of heaven. Remember heaven we were talking about is government, is, is political power, is the rulership of the day. This angel goes out in the midst of heaven with the everlasting gospel to preach to those that dwell on the earth and to every nation and to every kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. So this is the first message. There is a messenger that goes, excuse me, that goes out and, and gives this message, fear God. That's followed up by a second message, another angel, verse 8. The message is Babylon is fallen. And that puts us in, a, in the right time frame, doesn't it? Babylon is fallen, that great city who was linked to all the nations of the world. That's, that city, Babylon, is no more. And then finally, the third message, the third angel in verses 9 and 10 go out and give a warning to all the nations of the world to beware that you don't worship the beast. You don't place your allegiance against the king who's uh, set up his throne in Jerusalem. And so you have these three messages going out at that time when, when Jesus and the saints um, uh, are spreading it throughout the world. It's a serious message because you come back to, to chapter 19. For those who resist, those who even try to resist this awesome army, if, that's, if they even thought that was possible, destruction awaits. Leaders of the opposing forces, uh, along with anyone who followed them, are destroyed in a lake of fire. It's a symbol of total destruction. I want you to keep that in the back of your mind for now. We'll come back to the lake of fire shortly. But I want to point out that this is a choice. On, on one hand, the power of Christ and his armies will overwhelm any opposition. But the destruction of men is not the aim here in, in Revelation 19. Even knowing that we're talking about the symbolism, it's, it's hard to read about the battle array in, say, verse 15, and the birds that come to feast on dead bodies in verse 17, and, and to think of anything other than a massacre. But as you read through this, think about the sword of the king. He's not holding that sword in his hand. It's a sword that's coming out of his mouth. He's setting out to use the sword of the spirit to conquer the flesh. And all those who respond, he'll bring into his kingdom. Those who choose to resist will be destroyed in the symbolic lake of fire. And with that victory, or rather with this series of victories, the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. So if the sword is in his mouth, what is in his hand is a rod of iron. Verse 15 tells us that's how he's going to rule the nations, with this rod of iron. It's firm, it's unyielding. All the nations of the earth will be compelled to resist, uh, to, to submit to him. No matter their form of political or religious affiliation. I, I just want to make a comment here because it's important to to note that that's not our position now. That compulsion to uh, make people believe in God is not our position. For now, our responsibility is to witness and to uh, invite and, and to educate. But in the time to come, when Jesus Christ is revealed as king, his law will go forth from Jerusalem and cover the world. His way will be the only way that's acceptable. And what follows as we leap forward into chapter 20 is a dramatic scene where an angel captures and binds the dragon. And that really captures imagination. But this dragon has other names, other facets to his character. And I've put a picture on the screen that doesn't look very dragon-like. And the reason is that we're not talking about an actual dragon, Komodo or otherwise. 
like all these other symbols, this dragon persona is part of the, the characteristics of this entity. It's also known as that old serpent. It's called the devil and Satan. And when we exercise our Bible symbols, this all starts to make sense. Let me put this up on the screen here. Go back to chapter 12. We saw that the dragon was a political or a military power, and so it is here. The serpent really can only mean one thing because, as you remember, it's that old serpent. The old serpent from the Garden of Eden, who in its own wisdom argued that God didn't know what he was talking about. And so you have this fleshly wisdom, this carnal wisdom, that is a philosophical difference from the truth of God. The term devil means a liar or a false accuser, arguing against truth. And the term Satan means adversary, capital letter or, or not. And together, these symbols describe opposition to God in all facets of human life. And so it's right that I have a human, human-like figure that's being captured and bound. And it's this instinct of rebellion against God, this wretched side of human nature that is being bound, not destroyed, but contained for a thousand years. And why? We read about this thousand years. This is the kingdom of Jesus Christ, and it will be a time of peace and joy and contentment and, above all, godly focus. Human nature, self-will, self-centeredness, has an ugly way of pushing itself forward and demanding attention. The Apostle Paul described it as a constant battle in his mind. But for the duration of the kingdom age, this blessing will be granted to all the king's subjects. That human nature, the worst, the worst bits of human nature, and especially that dragon-like hunger for domination and, and political control, that will be contained. And if you read ahead uh, through the first few verses of uh, Revelation chapter 20, you'll see this time period of a thousand years repeated over the next five verses. The dragon in, in, verse, in verse 3 will be contained for a thousand years and only afterward it will be released for, for a little season. Let me just uh, throw this up here on, on the screen. This little season at the end. Just keep that in the back of your mind. Verse 4, those who've suffered and remained faithful are rewarded with, with crowns and with thrones to live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Verse 5, another resurrection will follow at the end of that thousand years. Verse 6, those who are first resurrected are made kings and priests for the duration of a thousand years. Are you getting the point? Verse 7, the adversary, the dragon, is released after a thousand years and at that point goes out to stir up the nations in opposition against the king. We've got at the start of the, at the start of the thousand years a 50-year period of judgment and I'm not going to go into that at the moment. If you'd like to um, have a look at that in more detail, uh, do have a look at the event, uh, event subsequent to the return of Christ uh, book by Brother Jim Cowie. At the end of a thousand years, there is this little season. I'm going to put a question mark there. I'm going to put a question mark because if a season on a day for a year principle um, is a season is 90 days, one, one quarter of a year, then, then a season in Bible prophecy becomes 90 years. So this little season of rebellion is going to be less than 90 years. And you know, God does love to, uh, to work in patterns for us. So is it possible? that that could be a 50-year period at the end of the millennium. That's a suggestion. Um, but let me, let me focus in on that thousand years of peace in the middle. Jesus is making a point here, obviously, right? You know, a thousand years, a thousand years being repeated over and over again, asking us to look at this thousand-year period. Now, after all, the symbols that we've looked at through the book of Revelation, why is this one? so special? Why is this one so real? We've already talked about and have continued to discuss this 
prophetic tool where a day equals a year, and that's well known. Uh, we've been using it during this study quite a lot already. But as it relates to God, there's a different time scale at work. Let me take two passages, one from the Psalms and the other from Peter. And both of these refer to God and specifically refer to God's time. Psalm 90 verse 4. For a thousand years in thy sight, in God's sight, are but as yesterday when it's past. In 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 8. A thousand years in the... A single day is like a thousand years with the Lord, and a thousand years are like a single day. And so, yes, it, it does um, talk to the fact that God experiences time differently to the way, uh, to the way that we do. But you have this reference, this, this focus on a thousand years. Now, it's, you know, this is not a proof, but isn't it interesting that none of Adam's descendants are recorded as living beyond Methuselah? 969 years old. 1,000 years is outside the human experience. It belongs to God, which means that when we look back on the Genesis record of creation over six days plus a day of rest, then after 6,000 years, if one day equivalent to 1,000 years, after 6,000 years of human history, we now look forward to the kingdom with a promised rest of a further 1,000 years, and we see a pattern in the way that God has laid out his works. You'll want to read more about the millennium of Christ. You, you will. The king, his subjects, the transformed planet, the saints in glory, the temple in Jerusalem, the response of the nations, all described in the prophets. Go and find them. Um, talk about it. Actually, lean forward now, and, um, and if you like, Add your favourite verses into the chat. Do everything you can to make, make it real. This is your future that we're talking about. I'm going to let you keep putting uh, quotes in as, as you think about them, your favourite quotes that talk about, uh, talk about the kingdom to come. Meanwhile, this snapshot in Revelation 20 takes us straight through to the end of the millennium. The focus isn't on the details of the kingdom the beauty of the kingdom age, the amazing uh, vision of, of the king glory, none of that is the focus of this chapter. The focus is on the final rebellion, and you'll recognise the names, Gog and Magog. You, you, you know those from, from the Battle of Armageddon when they, they led the, the, the armies of the world against the, the beloved city. And here, Gog and Magog are again caught up in in a, in, a, in a revolution, in a rebellion. It's been a thousand years since they've been mentioned, but the same spirit of anger and pride and humanism drives this gathering. Um, different to the Battle of Armageddon, when the attacking forces came from the north. Instead, this rabble here are gathered from all over the world and they made a choice at the end of that 50 year, that little season, after the, the madness of human nature is allowed to unfurl once more, they gather against their king. And they gather from all over the world. They make this choice, those who are involved, they make this choice to stand against their king. And every person on the earth at that time must make a choice. Either join the riot and storm the city of the saints, or stay separate. Now, remember, for a thousand years, there's been no war. There's been no training. There's been no weapons. And yet this force have gathered to protest their independence. I found it interesting in looking through the pictures of the riots in Melbourne over the last couple of weeks, the, the demonstrations. And I thought I'd throw this one up just to give you the sense of people en masse exerting their, um, their rights, as will happen at the end of the millennium, at the end of a thousand years. But the more I look at this picture, the more I see this same spirit. Have a look at those signs. I found the signs interesting. Unmask the truth. And you can almost hear 
the rebellion of human nature as it rises up and tries to take control with that dragon-like spirit in, in command. Um, it tries to take control over Christ and the saints. Unmask the truth. You can't silence the awakened. There's another one in there, my body, my choice. It's all about me. And then right up the back, which you might not be, even be able to see, I can make out on the original here, right up the back there's a faint sign that you can see which cries freedom. So this mob of people seeking to rule by virtue of numbers, this mob of people in Revelation 20 march up to, uh, to the beloved city. They marched up. Revelation 20 verse 9 says, over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. There's no glorious battle. There's no domination of military might. It is simply God judging those who stand up against his anointed. Perhaps they've forgotten the power of the king. Perhaps they've been willingly ignorant. They chose to be ignorant. But the end result is inevitable. God gave each person living on the earth the choice of whether they wanted the kingdom or not. And these people, at this time in the future, make their choice and are destroyed by fire. This is the final battle. And after this, the dead are raised again as a second resurrection and death and hell are opened up and the sea is opened up as well. And all those who have lived and died through the millennium are raised to life and a, a second judgment takes place. And Jesus again sits as judge on his white throne and the books are open. And there you have the book of life. And there are other books as well with a record of those who have been faithful other books with details of the lives they lived and the lessons that they've learned. And as a result of this process, many more, many more will be made immortal. And I say that because if we, by God's grace, as saints, are to be first fruits of the family of God, and the first fruits are just a small group that is gathered first, it stands to reason that the, the number of those saved from the millennium will be many times more than uh, those who are glorified when Christ returns. This resurrection and this judgment is final. Those living on the earth are either deemed worthy or are destroyed in that symbolic lake of fire. And that symbol, remember, was of complete destruction and appears again in, 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 here in chapter 20. And this time, if you, if you look forward to verse 14, there's a promise that death and hell will be cast into that lake of fire, completely destroyed. How can death be destroyed? Only when it's no longer possible to die. And, and what about the grave? The grave or hell can only be destroyed when there are no more mortal humans to fill it. So for the first time in 7,000 years, the earth is completely empty of mortal humans. Instead, it's filled exclusively with immortalised humans. And this is where it gets really exciting. The Apostle Paul appears to have been given one very special blessing. He writes, let me put it up on the screen here, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he writes, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, caught up into paradise, and he, he heard things that cannot be told. He wasn't allowed to say any more. He had this vision of something called the third heaven. And he was told to lock it away, to never mention it to anyone, not to give any clues as to what it was all about. So if the first heaven, the first government, right, was human rulership and think about the, the, the beasts of, of Daniel with the, the various kingdoms of, uh, of, of the, the, king, the, the nations of men, if the first heaven was human rulership and then the second heaven, the second government was Christ 
ruling the kingdom for a thousand years. The third heaven then is speaking about a time that's beyond the millennium, which is still a mystery to us today. So Paul was given this secret that he wasn't allowed to share, which no one else had seen until John. Here in chapter 21, that time is described as a new heaven and a new earth, another epoch in human history that's mostly hidden from us and will be revealed by God when the time's right. He hasn't told us much, but let's see, what can we piece together? First of all, it's paradise. Um, 2 Corinthians 12 told us that directly. We get that word paradise directly from the Greek language. It means a park or a garden. It's the same word that's used in the Septuagint, the, the Greek Old Testament, Greek version of the Old Testament. Um, it's used of the Garden of Eden. It's that word paradise. Secondly, there is a new heaven, a new style of government, and there's new earth, new subjects. But you'll also notice, and we're in chapter 21, verse, uh, verse 1 now, you'll also notice that there's no more sea. What a strange concept. Where did, where did all the sea go? Remember, we're talking in symbols. And the sea is often used in prophecy. Daniel talks about beasts coming out of the sea. And the Psalms speak of God's people coming from the sea. Isaiah links the sea with the people of the world. Jesus himself uses this symbol. In Luke chapter 21, verse 25, he, he gave this, uh, this prophecy that upon the earth there would be distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Nations of the world broken up into tumult, like, like the raging waters in the way that they're behaving. And you'll remember earlier in his, uh, in his ministry that his disciples were out on a boat and it was the power of Jesus' voice, the power that he had in his command where he was able to speak to the, to the waters, command the seas, and they obeyed him. And then there was one final verse that caught my interest in Revelation 4, verse 6. Revelation 4, verse 6 described the sea as well, but it says before the throne, the vision of the throne, before the throne there was a sea of glass. So at that particular moment in time, when the kingdom is established, the nations of the earth uh, during the reign of Christ who have been told by Christ, peace, be still. Instead of raging and frothing, the, they are instead calmed at his word. And now here in Revelation 21, this is the future, future vision. And I don't have a slide that says no more see. It would be a bit of a blank slide. But it makes sense. The, the world now at this point, beyond the millennium, when everyone is immortal, the world is no longer filled with nations, but with one people, one family. And speaking of family, perhaps the greatest vision of all of that future time that we know so little about is in those verses that we read in our introduction tonight. Verse, chapter 21, verses 1 through to 7. God himself will be there with them, with his people. He will dwell with them. No more sin and death, no more sorrow and crying, no more pain. All those things are past. The promises that God has given are fulfilled. God's covenant is everlasting. And so verse 7, a lovely turn of phrase, verse 7 uh, links all the way back to those overcoming uh, instructions of Revelation 2 and 3. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So those were the three significant things that we told about that future. And the rest is still sealed away. And as amazing as the kingdom is going to be, what God holds in store for his people, what's still to be revealed, will be so much more. But then we're brought back, back to a much closer future because 
from verse 9, we begin a second vision of the bride. And this will run through, this vision runs through all the way to chapter 22, verse 6. This is a vision of the bride described as a building, as a city. And this city descends from heaven. It's called New Jerusalem. And, and I love how even now there is this reinforcement of the lessons that we've been learning. Where the city of Babylon, remember Babylon, uh, Babylon had its origins in Babel. With, it began with men who tried to elevate themselves and tried to build a tower up to heaven. That was never going to succeed. And instead here you have a city that comes from God, a city who is built and made by God and descends from heaven, figuratively speaking, because the city itself describes the bride of Christ, all of the saints who, who make up uh, that building. They make up stones, of, of uh, the living stones of a city. And everyone who's belonging to New Jerusalem, everyone who's part of the bride of Christ, has been born of God. I'm conscious of time, I'm not going to go into great detail about this vision, but here's a few points on the slide to consider. Some of the characteristics of this city. The city is a perfect cube. The length, and verse 16 says this, right? The length and the breadth and the height are, are all the same. Just like another significant building in Israel's history. The other perfect cube that we're told about is the most holy place, the centre of worship for God. This, this building, this city, has the number 12 all over it, all over its measurements, uh, pointing, pointing to Israel, to the true Israel of God. It has 12 gates. It has 12 foundations. There are 12,000 furlongs in length. 144, for those who are remembering their, their maths, 144 is 12 times 12. The, the, the wall is 144 cubits high. Everything links back to the Israel of God. And there's gems of every kind that make up its foundations, linking back again to the high priest's breastplate in the Old Testament, but also to the apostles because their names are written in the foundations of the city. And the walls are made of jasper. Um, uh, a crystal, crystal-like stone, and its purest form is, is, is very clear. And the gates of the city are made of a single pearl. Twelve gates, twelve pearls that allow entry into that city. Jesus, in his parables, talked about the pearl of great price and the value that we place on something that, that, is, uh, that, that, is, that is worth something to us. And this city is made of pure gold, but it's not ostentatious gold. It's gold that is like transparent glass. All these characteristics uh, you'll find as you look through your Bible. The gold of tried faith, the precious gems representing the people that God treasures, God's love for his people Israel. The city's filled with the light of God's glory. It's lit by the presence of the Lamb himself. And verse 22 tells us that no temple is required because there's no need at this moment in history with this group of people, there's no need to have a specific place to meet God. God is always present with this city, with this bride of Christ. And it's very welcoming. The city never sleeps. It's always welcoming those who come to worship God in holiness. And clearly this is a summary of saints in glory, and that's clarified in verse 27 where it says that nothing unclean will ever enter it, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. <clears throat> and the focus then shifts to another feature of New Jerusalem, to the throne of uh, chapter 22, verse 1. And the promise that's implicit in these verses is that the king, sitting on the throne, cares for his subjects. And the water of life that, that flows from the throne is, is key to their survival and to the prosperity of the nations under his care. I, I could ask, I, I won't, I've got, um, I've got a few minutes left, but I could ask you what, uh, what you understand by the water of life. But it's such a common metaphor that I'm sure you all know that it symbolises the word of God. 
that's coming out from the throne, that's, that's being shared with all of the nations. And the king provides for his people. As, they, as, as the water flows from the throne, it feeds the tree, trees of life. I had a picture of an orange tree as well, but, um, but Jane doesn't like oranges. So I'm, I'm going with this apple tree. Beautiful picture of a tree by, planted by a river of water. And if your version doesn't already show it, in, in chapter 22, verse 2, make this note. These are trees of life, plural. Trees of life. They provide food and healing for the nations of the world. Have a think about what do these trees of life represent? They take the blessings from the throne and they are there for the healing of the nations. They provide sustenance. They provide comfort and care for the nations of the world. These are the saints. Why? Because they're taking the water from the throne and providing for the needs of the nations. And they have this link to the 12 of, of Israel. There are 12 manner of fruits that are born by these trees. Um, and for them, there's no curse. They, they serve the king. They see him face to face. And we were talking about what's written in your forehead. These saints have the name of their king in their foreheads. <clears throat> It's a vision of harmony. Uh, it's a beautiful picture of a world that is resting from the troubles that it once faced. And that vision will soon be reality. Jesus is coming, whether, whether we are ready or not. We live in a world that's explained by science. You know, laws of physics explain gravity, not very well, but, but, but they do. We observe weather patterns, we, we measure radio waves. But what we've been talking about here tonight is not measurable it's not able to be quantified any more than we can measure or observe god the promises that we've gone over tonight are seen through the eye of faith and yes we have very good reason to believe but even so your response to this vision must be a response of faith it has to come from faith and knowing that knowing that Faith is so important. Jesus Christ himself has one more, one, one final message for you. Behold, I come quickly. Chapter 22, verse 7, and it's mentioned three times in this last appeal from Jesus Christ himself. Three times he's met, he mentions that he is, he re repeats that he's coming quickly or suddenly. And, and other Bible passages describe the unexpectedness of his return, coming like a thief in the night um, or at an hour when they're not aware. That's not the case here because Jesus' words here are a promise. He will return. He will not delay his return without reason. And look at the comfort in verse 7 that Jesus gives to John. He says, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he that keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And then further down in verse 12, behold, look, look, lift up your eyes and see, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me. And it's repeated again in verse 20. Surely I come quickly. Jesus' promise is linked to the comfort of knowing that he comes to bless and reward those who have prepared themselves to meet him. So that raises the question for all of us, old and young, baptised and unbaptised, are we clear what preparation entails? What does it mean? What are, what are some of the things that the book of Revelation has taught us along the way? How do we keep the words of this book so that we can be ready to meet the Lord with joy? So here's a short list that I've put together in my last couple of minutes. Well, no, I didn't put it together in the last couple of minutes and talk about it here in my last couple of minutes. Just, a, just from the first few chapters, and you could go th back through all of Revelation, I recommend that you do, and look at the way that you can prepare uh, for the return of Christ. These are the things that were mentioned to the ecclesias. These are the things that you can do to prepare for the return of Christ. The first is to place your confidence in God. That's, that's key. That's foundation. God is the centre 
of this entire message and the focus for uh, the future. Maintain your zeal. That's, a, that's an interesting one because zeal is such an old fashioned word, but it implies drive and enthusiasm. Keep that alive. Share your confidence and your, uh, your excitement with, with others and with, with each other. Stand for Christ and stand with Christ. Sometimes that comes at a cost and, and that's something that we all need to, uh, need to consider. Grow in faith. Don't stay stagnant. Never, never think that you've now reached the pinnacle of uh, who you could be because we all have potential and God sees that potential in each one of us. Choose to value truth. An interesting one in a, in a, in a world that is increasingly moving away from the idea of, um, of absolute truth. We know that God is true. We know that Jesus Christ, his, his name that we've talked about tonight, is faithful and true. These are the things that we also value if we're going to stay with, stand with him. Learn to recognise and resist evil. And then finally, stay awake, be, be alert, be, be watchful. All these characteristics are, are characteristics of people who are overcoming. And the, the Greek word there, I don't know if we looked at it, but the Greek word means to be victorious. Um, it's very similar to the word Nike in, in Greek. Um, you will overcome. And the reason we can be sure of that is because the victory has already been won. In John 16, verse 33, Jesus was quite, was quite clear. Be of good cheer, he said to his disciples. I have overcome the world. And so we've come to the end, only to find that it's not an end after all, but a beginning. It's a beginning with God at the centre, with Jesus Christ ruling in righteousness and where you and I can stand with him in immortality. No wonder the Apostle John longed for his return. And we can echo John's response. When Jesus says, surely I come quickly, we also say, Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus.